thank you. Thank you all for coming out. And I was doing a bit of a count or, or going over the um, uh, history of the uh, annual Phyllis Clark Memorial Lecture. And tonight's actually the 26th year. Now, they are quite remarkable. Um, and it, it, it's not actually the 26th lecture. In the first year we had it, 1989, and, and Joe will speak a little bit about who Phyllis Clark was. Uh, but 1989, the year following uh, 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 Phil Phyllis's uh, passing, uh, there were actually three Phyllis Clark lectures. Now, some of the veterans here, like Meyer, might, might have some insight into why three. Very ambitious. I find it tough enough to pull one off. Uh, but but uh, here we are. Uh, Joe, Joe is president of QP Local 3903? Four. 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 Sorry, 3903. Uh, and and <coughs> I have to make a point of saying the Canadian Union of Public Employees, Ontario, and the Canadian Union of Public Employees Locals here at Ryerson uh, have been very generous to the lecture. If it weren't for their financial contributions, we wouldn't be able to do little things like have people like Stephanie fly in here, or Robert Pollan, or Patrick Bond, or, or, or. Uh, it just couldn't be done. Okay, thanks, Brian. Um, hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to the uh, 15th, uh, to the uh, Phyllis Clark Lecture for 2015. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here tonight and have a chance to say uh, a few words about Phyllis. Um, I had a bit of a personal connection with Phyllis for a number of years. When I first started here at Ryerson in the early 1980s, uh, my office happened to be directly across the hall from Phyllis's. And uh, many a morning, uh, Phyllis would cross that hall and into my office and she would borrow a cigarette. Um, and we'd smoke the cigarettes and we'd talk about two of Phyllis's favorite topics. One was politics, and the other one, believe it or not, was the Toronto Maple Leafs. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it was, it was unusual. It was an unusual combination of uh, subjects, to say the least. The thing about Phyllis was that she did a lot more than just talk about politics. She lived politics. She lived politics in socialist political parties. She lived politics in the union movement, in feminist organizations, in community activism, and, of course, in teaching. You know, there's a famous story about Phyllis that in um, 1953 she ran in a federal election as a candidate for the Communist Party in Saskatchewan. Her opponent in that election was John Diefenbaker. Who <laughs> won? Um, she, she lost. Uh, but, you know, hey, talk about optimism, right? I mean, there was, uh, and that was really what Phyllis was all about optimism that a better world was possible. Uh, she also served for many years on the Toronto Public Library Board, and there she emphasized the importance of Canadian literature, especially in our schools and in our libraries, and to make sure the uh, Canadian young, young people were exposed to it. She was also a founding member of the first union to represent GAs and TAs, and that, that union later on became the Canadian Union of Educational Workers, or QW and QW ultimately later on merged with QP, and as a result, QP now represents contract faculty, precarious faculty, <laughs> traveling faculty, TAs and GAs, and, and, and we're in the news a lot these days. Um, she was active uh, in tenants' rights issues, <coughs> served for many years on the board of Parkdale Community Legal Services, and last but not least, she was a valued member of the politics department from 1977 until her death in 1988. And when she died, uh, a colleague observed about Phyllis. He said, for as long as I have known her, the work that Phyllis did was inseparable from the obsession, from the obsession for it with a just order, where the free development of each is the condition for the free development of all. And this lecture series, which began in 1989, is dedicated to that principle. And QP is very proud to be a sponsor of this, this series. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to turn to my introduction uh, of Stephanie. Stephanie is a professor uh, of uh, labor studies at the uh, City University of New York um, in the uh, jo Joseph Murray Murphy Institute for Worker Education. And I think we all know her 
primarily through her work on the living wage. She, she probably not probably she is the foremost uh, American academic uh, who has written about, studied, documented the American living wage movement. Uh, she's the author of Fighting for a Living Wage and co-author of The Living Wage: Building a Fair Economy and another volume entitled The Measure of Fairness. Uh, she has a brand new book out, which I'm, I've been thumbing through of late, uh, 2014 publication, entitled Labor Movements, uh, Global Perspectives. And so clearly given the topic that we have tonight, uh, there, there's no one who could, uh, uh, who's in a better position to speak on low wage work, low wage workers, and from an international point of view. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. It's really such an honor to be here and to hear about Phyllis Clark and to learn about her. And to even be at a university that would honor such a woman is, is, is a wonderful thing. And uh, I feel like she would have been a great person to know. I actually got my uh, initial interest in the area of low-wage work. My first paid job when I was 12, I worked as a softball umpire. I was a big baseball fan. and. Um, I learned that I was getting paid less than all the boys. I was the only girl. And I found out that I was at a much lower salary. So that got my interest both in feminism and labor issues uh, from an early age. So uh, so it's really, it feels great to be able to speak um, at the Phyllis Clark lecture. I also uh, feel really uh, happy to be here. I don't know if happy is the right word, but it's nice to be here during this major labor struggle here in Toronto right now. And I've also been active in my own grad student and faculty unions for many years and, and we've been working a lot on the issue of precarious and adjunct labor um, so I feel a lot of solidarity with your struggles here and I think it's really emblematic this these strikes going on is really emblematic of the talk that I want to give tonight which is this talk of what's happening to work what's going on in the, in the, the labor world um, and, and this is kind of historic moment when the world seems to be kind of finally acknowledging that we have a severe crisis going on in terms of inequality and low-wage work. Um, you know, and I think for most of us on the left, it, this is not new. We've known this for a long time. The crisis didn't start with 2008. Yeah, this crisis has been there for a long time. Um, but right now, we really do have historic levels of inequality, both within countries and between countries. And it's, you know, around the globe. It's, it's in rich countries and in poor countries. We see uh, very high incomes among a very select few, um, both high incomes and high wealth. And at the bottom, we see stagnating wages or even falling wages. Or even in some countries where the wages are rising, like in China, they're, they're rising from a very low level. So we have a, the, the issue of low-wage labor and inequality is a crisis around the world. Um, and it didn't start with the crisis. Uh, you know, even on the eve of the crisis in 2007, uh, analysts at Morgan Stanley were talking about this dramatic change in labor's share of national income around the world, saying things are going to happen. This cannot be sustainable to have labor's share of income going down so low. And that was in 2007. Um, so clearly, things are even much worse. Um, the expansion of the working poor and of the vulnerable population since the crisis has only been worse. So I think what's changing a bit is for a long time we had the kind of mainstream explanations of why we have this inequality. And the mainstream would say it's about technology, new technologies, workers need to be trained in the STEM fields, They're, they need to keep up, get high you know, education, um, and it's about globalization which is inevitable and that's just a fact of life and everyone has to get on board. And I think increasingly we're seeing uh, people acknowledge that that's wrong, or at least incomplete. That maybe that plays a little part of it, but it's very incomplete. And I don't know how many of you saw the IMF study that came out just a few weeks ago, uh, maybe a month. The International Monetary Fund, of all places, mm -hmm. says inequality is a problem and unions might be part of the solution. <laughs> um, I read that three times because I felt like maybe it was a different IMF, maybe it was like the, mine, the metal workers or something, but it was the monetary, International Monetary Fund. So it's not just even mainstream economists, economists that were once proponents of neoliberalism. Anyone from Joe Stiglitz to Paul Krugman to Jeffrey Sachs are saying that they were wrong. They were saying they were wrong 10 years ago. Um, now we have the IMF, we have the Pope, we have Piketty. Everyone's saying inequality is a serious problem and we need to address it. Um, and if it's not just technology and it's not tech, uh, globalization, what is going on? So, a lot of attention is looking at wages, what's happening at the low end of the labor market. Um, and what we see is that 
on the one hand, we have this very high income segment. We have a small number of people, but they make a lot of money, and they demand a lot of services, restaurants and tourism and, and uh, housekeepers and so forth, that are low-wage workers. And they don't have to be low-wage, but they are. But also the low-wage workforce serves not just the 1%, but many in the so-called middle class who are relying on low-wage labor, in a sense, as a stopgap measure, to, as a survival strategy. So as more and more women, uh, parents with children, enter the labor market and they're pushed to work long hours, they're forced to rely on bringing in domestic workers from other countries or child care providers or restaurant fast food workers that can fill the gap of doing that reproductive labor that more women used to be able to do when they were not working as many hours for work or when we didn't have so many household members having to work so many hours just to cover the paycheck. So in a way, it's also a stopgap measure. By having this very low-wage workforce available, it, it doesn't necessarily lead to this blowing up, this crisis of kind of trying to balance work and family life. Like if we didn't have access to low-wage childcare labor, maybe by now we might have had other movements of working parents that just went on strike and said, this is unsustainable, we can't do it. Um, so we have kind of the demand for low-wage labor. Um, but it's not that those jobs have to be low wage. Like we, we have low wage retail in the US, same employers, same companies are high wage in Sweden. Or we have McDonald's that pays $7.25 in the US and it pays $16 or $19 in Denmark or $16 or $17 in Australia. So the jobs themselves don't have to be low wage. And so it's not just inevitable. So I think the other part of the story is that there really is an ideological commitment. This is a political program to keep wages low. Low wages are in fact a fundamental plank of a neoliberal program that says this is the way you attract investors to your country or to your state or to your city is to create a positive business climate to keep wages low and attract um, investment but also to keep down pressures, inflationary pressures because who hates inflation more than anyone? Obviously the financial sector and the financial sector has a lot of pressure on governments to say, keep wages low. Not just the finance industry, but obviously institutions like the IMF that you know, goes into countries like Mexico and says, we know it says in your constitution that workers have the right to a living wage, but you have to kind of ignore that and you know, keep wages down because you need to be attracting foreign capital. So it's about keeping wages low, suppressing wages in order to attract investment, to create a positive business climate, to keep down inflationary pressures. Um, and it's also this notion of labor flexibility, which is in fact built into the neoliberal golden straitjacket, as Thomas Friedman calls it, of the policies that we need to promote in countries so that employers can maximize profit. So what we've seen is over the last several decades, First, employers had adopted just-in-time production, where they could maximize profit by keeping their inventories as low as possible, by shifting the cost of inventory onto the suppliers instead of the company. And I don't know, I feel like probably you all are a sophisticated crowd and you get how the Walmart model works, but it's, it's really extraordinary. The more you, know, you look at it, the more it's hard to believe, but Walmart has really mastered this notion where they don't actually own things often until they act the product crosses the scanner. They're essentially just leasing space on their shelves. So if the bananas don't sell, then the, the, the grower has to eat the cost of those bananas. It's a way for them to totally reduce their risks of sales and just to maximize the, the profit they make from being a logistics company, really. That's really what they are. Um, so they learned how to maximize profit by keeping inventories as low as possible, having the suppliers adopt all the cost of selling and the risks of selling. And now they've said, hey, we can do that with our workforce. Labor is a, you know, a uh, constant cost. We need it to be a variable cost. We don't want to have any risks of hiring too many people and then not having enough sales or having bad weather. Um, we don't want to have any commitment to paying benefits. Uh, and and we, we just want the minimum number of people there that we need. So we've seen this move to just-in-time scheduling where we have people getting hired in, in the UK with a zero hours contract. You're hired with no guarantee of work. Um, or you're hired in the retail, in, you know, retail stores in Manhattan 
and you're given eight hours a week. That's what you're guaranteed. And everything else after that, you're on probation for two to three months, eight hours a week. You try and pick up extra shifts, but really what you are is an on-call worker. And you have to call the night before, or you call that morning two hours before to say, do you need me to come into work? Some people have a one or two hour commute. It's Manhattan. It's, they can't live in Manhattan. So what they're doing is they're now paying the costs of the risks of doing business. If it's bad weather, if it's raining, if the, the company is not meeting their sales projections, they don't want to have extra workers come in or they want to be able to send them home. Um, and what they're doing is they're getting pressure. These retailers, they're part of large corporations. They have their monthly sales goals, their hourly sales goals, and they have their monthly and hourly payroll projections. And the managers are watching these numbers with very sophisticated technology, and they're watching the numbers of customers coming in and out, and they're tracking what they call conversion rates, the number of customers who come in and who leave with a package. And if they're not meeting their hourly goals, then they start sending people home, or they tell them not to come in. So what this is is a model of flexibility, which sounds really good because it sounds like it works for everyone. It sounds like it's a win-win. But in fact, it's giving all the flexibility to the employer. And it's saying that the employee will eat the costs of the risks of the employment relationship. And this is a new frontier, a new way for employers to maximize profit under this neoliberal regime. Um, now that's a lot what we're seeing at the low wage labor market, we're seeing it retail, in fast food, some of the workers on call have to come in and sit in the fast food restaurant to be on call for their shift to find out if they need to be come in the back to work the shift. So this is clearly, like clearly that's work. I don't know how anyone gets away with saying that's not work. Um, but that's the movement we're seeing in the low wage workforce. But obviously that's the model of the adjunct labor, right? That's the adjunct faculty model, which is the universities say, we do not want to commit to hiring you until we know the day of or the day before whether we have enough students to make it worth our while to hire you. We don't want to have any commitment semester to semester, year to year. We don't want to lock you into some tenure track system. We don't want to have any commitment here. You're going to eat the risks of, of this relationship. So it's not just a low wage, you know, low skill model. It's this flexibility is what we're seeing throughout increasingly up the chain, the occupational chain. Adjunct uh, faculty, freelance <coughs> computer workers, graphic designers, lawyers. Lawyers are now increasingly uh, adopting this model, architects. This flexible model is for the most part flexible for employers and not for workers. Now, the EU has recognized that this is a problem and has promoted this notion of what they call flex security, which is meant to give a little security along with the flexibility, but most of the research shows the security part is severely lacking. Or where it's there, it's, it, there's more security for the workers that you would predict have more security that are a bit more established in the labor market, and marginal workers do not have that security marginalized workers. Okay, so that's one of the trends that we're seeing behind the low-wage work. It's, it's, so there's a demand for low-wage work, but there's also an ideological commitment to a model of low-wage work. And alongside that, we're also seeing other trends that we, we know about, uh, which uh, the economist Richard Freeman talks about the great doubling, the fact that since the early 1990s, the global labor force has more than doubled with the entry of China and India and the former Soviet Union entering the capitalist labor market, doubling the workforce, but not necessarily doubling the amount of capital and jobs. So we have increased competition for work, increased competition within country and between countries, and we all feel this stress of like that we need a job at the same time that austerity is taking away our safety net. So it means that if we don't win that competition for a job, you know, it's pretty serious. So there's greater reason to compete against each other because of material realities of the labor force and also less safety net to fall back on. And then obviously the other uh, factor behind this is alongside flexibility, another piece of the neoliberal program is changing the rules of the game for capital versus labor. And that's just so easy to see everywhere across the board that we've not, that we've deregulated but we've re-regulated a way that gives capital more rights and labor less rights. And it's nothing that makes that more obvious than comparing free trade agreements and, and immigration policy, where we're loosening the border, making it easier and easier 
for jobs and money to cross borders and harder and harder for people to cross borders or to cross with full citizenship rights. So we have an increase in international migration. International migration is at an all-time high. And even migration within country without full rights, such as in China, workers moving, giving up essentially their rights to move uh, in, in search of work. Um, and in the US, you know, I know, I know this goes on everywhere. You know, I'm more familiar with the US stories, the horror <coughs> stories that we hear of. I was uh, invited to be part of an investigation a couple years ago, Hershey Chocolate Factory in Hershey, Pennsylvania, was importing, I'll, I'll call it importing because it was like a commodity, students under this exchange program from around the world. They were coming from like 15 different countries on a program that was supposed to be learning the American culture, learning English, learning the US ways for the summer. And it turned out what they were be doing is packaging chocolate in a hot factory, <laughs> dangerous jobs in the middle of Pennsylvania. They were being charged $600 each for housing a month to live eight people in one bedroom apartments. When in Hershey, Pennsylvania, when the apartment itself cost nowhere near that, um, they were being put in rooms, whether male, female, different languages, different ethnicities, different religions being forced to share a room, working eight to 10 hour shifts in the, in the chocolate factory. And the same chocolate factory had laid off their unionized workers just the year before. Right. So the companies laying off you know, union workers, claiming a labor shortage, getting so-called guest workers in, which are 18 year old kids from, from China and Kazakhstan and Nigeria to, to work in the chocolate factory. <laughs> so it sounds like I'm making that up, that sounds <coughs> that can't possibly be true, but we did go there, and, and in this case, the students actually engaged in a sit-down strike, and they reached out to the community, and they made the demand that they should be reimbursed for the, the money they spent on the housing, and that the jobs should be returned to the work, to the community, the people in the community. So, anyways, that's, that's a bit of a side story, but that is an example of the kinds of trends we're seeing in, in this kind of move to the low-wage labor market. Um, that's just a particularly shocking story, but you can find those stories all over the world. Okay, so I um, said that I got interested first in low-wage work from my own experience as uh, working here in the U.S., but, and then I went from there to work on living wage campaigns in, in the United States, but increasingly I've been invited to participate in living wage campaigns around the world because more and more people are interested in this problem. Um, because we're starting to move from saying this is inevitable, this is just part of globalization, to saying this is a serious problem and so what can we do about it? And again, it's, it's an interesting moment in time because we're hearing mainstream voices say we've got to do something about this. Inequality is a problem. It's a problem for economic growth. There's more acknowledgement that without uh, rising wages we don't have a consumer base to sustain our economies. Um, and in fact, I heard just the TD Bank today released a report saying precarious jobs are now a, a crisis for the next two years, at least here in Canada. So it's not just the IMF, it's your, your banks here in Canada too. So there's an acknowledgement that it's, a, it's an economic problem, um, but there's also concern about social unrest. And that's because we are seeing some workers strike um, and protests around the world. Um, so. People are starting to say, what can we do? How do we address this problem of low-wage work? And again, I think if I was, you know, when I was giving this talk maybe five years ago, there was a little bit of a debate about, well, we can't do a lot, not only because globalization is inev inevitable, but that states are irrelevant. That there's nothing that governments can do anymore because, you know, corporations trump governments. But I think the shift also is acknowledging the ways in which our governments um, crop up the neoliberal programs and push things like austerity. And in fact, they, they do have agencies still. They may be captured in many parts by capital, but there are still places to intervene um, to promote a different agenda. Okay, so one of those solutions that people are turning to is this notion of raising wages through minimum wages or living wage campaigns, other strategies to raise wages at the bottom. Um, okay, so first of all, uh, not all countries have minimum wages, but most do. The, many of that uh, that don't have minimum wages are some that still have stronger unions that have 
you know, resisted setting wages legislatively because they think it's an area of collective bargaining, but even that is breaking down. Germany just adopted its first minimum wage because it had to, you know, recognize that the system of setting wages high through unions was, was no longer sufficing to address wages at the bottom. So we're seeing wage campaigns in the global north, in the global south, in wealthy countries, in poorer countries. Um, countries have very different ways of setting minimum wages. Some set a daily wage, some set an hourly wage, some set, you know, I think India has about 1,200 different minimum wages depending on region and industry and occupation. Um, so it varies a lot. It's hard to generalize, but what we can generalize is in, in pretty much everywhere, the wages are not high enough to meet the basic costs of living. They're not living wages. Um, now, so the efforts to raise wages are coming in, an, in a variety of forms. We're seeing, one, legislative demands to raise, to either set a minimum wage for the first place or to raise it, um, either through you know, national legislation, city or state, um, or sometimes on ballot measures. Um, and in the United States, we've had um, a, a big increase uh, in the last couple of years in states and cities raising minimum wages. And I know in Canada, I don't think cities have the right to set minimum wages. In the US, it depends on the state. Only some states allow cities to do that. But in the last, so 10 years ago, only about four cities had minimum wages. In the last year, 19 cities set minimum wages in the United States. Um, some up to about $15 an hour, which is about doubling of the federal minimum wage. So this is a huge change, and I can talk more uh, about the specifics if, if you want to know about them. So one strategy is through legis pressing legislation, or doing it through a ballot initiative. Um, another is pressuring corporations to adopt higher wages voluntarily, and that's more, I think, in the model of the London living wage and some, uh, some of your work here in Canada in terms of living wage campaigns that pressure employers to adopt higher wages. And in some cases, employers are stepping out ahead, recognizing this movement. In the, in, in the past couple of months, we've had Walmart, Ikea, Gap, Target, uh, TJ Maxx, all of them announced that they would raise their own internal minimum wages to $9 or $10 an hour phasing in. And then we're also seeing some movement uh, in the area of setting regional wages, because I think a lot of people recognize that if one area raises their wage, it may be you know, a challenge for another area, you know, will, will jobs just move to that area or will employers threaten to do that? Um, last year, we had our first regional wage in the United States, two counties and Washington, D.C., so three entities together set a regional minimum wage, uh, which was something that we didn't think was gonna, was possible to do, but I guess they just did it, so that's good. <laughs> um, there's something called the Asia Floor Wage Campaign, which has been working to create a common methodology across Asia, working with trade unions and worker NGOs to say we're going to use a common framework for a living wage so that employers can't pit, pit us against each other so much. Um, and there's a few other examples like in the Gulf states, um, India, Nepal, Sri Lanka, and the Philippines have been working together to set a common minimum wage uh, for domestic workers and construction workers, migrant workers in the Gulf states. Now, obviously, these are hard to enforce. You can, you know, get agreements, but enforcement is a whole other matter. But it suggests that people are recognizing the need to try and not only raise wages, but do it across borders and collectively to avoid this, you know, race to the bottom pressure. Okay, let me see how much time. Okay, so um, what I want to ask, though, is like, what kind of explains this? Why are we seeing this dramatic increase in attention all of a sudden? The ILO has put a lot of resources into looking at how to define a minimum wage. It says it's one of the crucial battlefields for labor in the coming years. Um, what's going on? So I think there's some you know, interesting reasons. One is obviously this focus on inequality um, and the economic argument. The other is that the research in the economic discipline has changed quite a bit. And 10 to 15 years ago, the mainstream, certainly in the U.S., um, in fact, 90% of the economics discipline would say that if you raise wages, it would cut jobs. Um, some people would even say it would lead to inflation, though that wasn't really that credible. Um, but that has changed a lot. And I would say even in the U.S., in kind of the heart of this, the, the mainstream now says the benefits of raising wages outweighs any negative. And the research is not finding job loss due to, to increasing wages. 
that's not just the United States. Research in other countries is finding that as well. We're not seeing negative impacts from raising minimum wages. Uh, so the research is changing. The uh, public policy attention on, uh, is changing. Public support is not changing because actually what we know, public support has been there all along. Ever since we've had polling data, people support higher wages. And in fact, the polls often say that there's greater support for higher wages than lower wages. So that part has not changed. Um, and in, in the US, um, living wage, I mean minimum wage win almost always when they're on the ballot. They win in Republican states, they win in almost every county, they win among uh, evangelical Christian voters. So they're popular uh, among voters. Um, but I think what's really different right now is not just those factors. I think what changed a lot is that we had Occupy Wall Street. And I think that what Occupy Wall Street did is not only did it raise attention to inequality, um, but it really emboldened the labor movement and community organizations in a way that I think they hadn't been in a while. Because they saw that a group of people did not do focus groups, they didn't do any kind of fancy marketing, they just went out there and made a very bold statement and the public supported them. And we did have, in New York at least, a lot of veteran labor organizers and community organizers mentoring Occupy uh, activists, but also Occupy activists emboldening labor organizers. And some of those veteran organizers said, let's just go take this up a notch and let's just call these, let's just start having workers go on strike. Let's, let's have fast food workers strike, even though we don't have a full plan on how this is going to unfold. And let's make a real demand. And they got workers together and people said, well, $20 an hour is probably too much. We probably can't win that. But $10 an hour is too low. We can't live on that. Um, that's not a living wage. So let's ask for 15 So there was no math. There was no methodology. They said, let's go on strike and let's call for $15 an hour and the right to form a union. So that was a one-day strike following Occupy Wall Street in 2012, and that soon spread around the country, and in the last couple of years, it's been increasingly, it's up to uh, something like 190 <coughs> cities, um, and now it's, it's been also in other sectors. So Walmart workers have been striking, Walmart warehouse workers, um, security guards, uh, airport workers, uh, domestic workers. So more and more workers are striking, and they're saying, we want $15 an hour. Again, it's, there's no magic to that number, but, um, and we want to have a union. And I think that it has just given a life to the movement that hadn't been there for the prior 10 or 15 years because the living wage campaign's demands were more moderate and not it wasn't as bold of an action as taking a day-long strike. So I think that that has increased the stakes for the employers who feel like the pressure's there to do something about it. And it's also just increased pressure on cities to say, well, what can we do? Now, what's interesting is that those strikes have led to quite a bit of success in terms of raising wages. 29 states have raised their wage in 18, 18 or 19 cities. Um, and these companies, Walmart raising its wage is going to affect half a million workers. So the wages are winning, but the union demand, not winning, right? So that's not a surprise to anyone in this room, I'm sure. But it raises kind of the tensions of this movement, which is that the minimum wage campaigns are great things to do, but obviously employers and politicians are going to be a lot more quick to concede on the issue of raising wages that works for them than they are on the issue of ceding power to workers in the form of unions. Um, and we know that strikes are what have been effective. I mean, oh, I can't say we know, but I, we have a hunch that the strikes have been effective in doing, uh, pushing these wages, but one of the reasons these workers have been able to strike is because they're not union. They have more rights as non-union workers in the U.S. than they would if they were unionized. Um, so they, they have more protection to get their jobs back if they uh, are replaced, um, and they have maybe perhaps more public support. So this is a tension here, which is everyone you know involved in planning these movements knows that unions is a big part of this. We also know that we are winning more legislatively because unions have lost the power to win wage demands in the workplace through traditional collective bargaining or unionizing. Um, but it doesn't mean unions are irrelevant because this mo movement would not be happening without unions. So there's, there is a tension here and there's a way we have to kind of think about what's this relationship and how to move forward. Now I will say, 
in the best case scenarios, unions are using these two organized new workers in places like in Seattle and SeaTac, and it's revitalizing their existing members who are coming to the union leaders and saying, this is great, I want to be involved. I was just at a uh, hearing in Philadelphia for a $15 an hour minimum wage, and most of the people testifying were union workers who already earn a lot more than $15 an hour, and they were there to testify for the $15 minimum because they saw it as something that they either believed in politically or personally because of family members or they just had a commitment to it, but it's something that it's not separate from the labor movement, even though it's, it's um, not yet winning any you know, new uh, organizing. Okay, um, you know, and an interesting fact, I, should, I, I meant to mention that in terms of these wage campaigns, the one place in the world that is raising the wages fastest due to strikes probably is in China. Um, and in fact, the Shanghai uh, city government just set a new citywide minimum wage of the equivalent of 275 an hour in U.S., which happens to be higher than the U.S. minimum wage for tip workers, which is 213 an hour. So um, it's kind of an interesting thing to note, which is that um, an unprecedented, ongoing, continual strike wave in China has led to uh, wages going up there at a faster pace than they are pretty much anywhere else. Okay, so let me just check on our time here. Um, okay, so I just want to say that, um, so these are some of the concerns, that the wage movement is exciting, there's a lot going on, uh, workers are winning higher wages, but we know that this is not a solution. This is not a solution to the issue of low-wage work, it's not a solution to poverty. Many workers don't have jobs at all, many don't have enough hours of work, Many of these workers are going to win this legislatively, but the wages won't be enforced. We know that's a huge problem. And obviously, they don't have job security. Without a union, they don't have any protection. So it's not a solution. Um, and in fact, in some ways, it may be problematic. These wage campaigns, I would say, things to worry about, which is one is that this is a point that I've made before, I think, when I'm here. But some of the campaigns have a tendency to divide the deserving poor from the non-deserving poor. And they're often framed as, these people who work hard for a living should not have to go hungry at night. They are just trying to do their jobs and feed their families. I agree with that entirely, but what about the people that don't have work, that don't have families, that aren't you know, in that same situation? I think we don't want to set up a case where they're uh, penalized and they're seen as the problem. And I highlight, highlight this because while cities have been passing living wage and minimum wages over the last 10, 20 years in the United States, they've also been passing lots and lots of anti-panhandling ordinances, um, not, can't sleep on the bench, you know, criminalizing poverty. And I think that our movement tend to, the living wage movement is in many ways a least common denom denominator movement. Because you can have a conservative argument for the living wage, you can have a left argument for the living wage, and if we focus only on the wage and the deserving poor, you know, we, we uh, marginalize parts of the workforce that we need to, to worry about, or, or not just the workforce of our society. So in many ways, the living wage and minimum wage is a liberal solution. It can be a liberal solution, which says, let's open the market, let's commodify more of our work, let's bring more people in from the informal sector to the formal sector and make sure they have a fair wage and then they have a contract for their work. Um, and so I think that we want to be sure as the left to not let the debate go in that direction. I think in the spirit of Phyllis Clark and the spirit of you know, what you all do here in Toronto is engaging in these movements but promoting a more radical vision, a more long-term vision about how to rethink work altogether. To rethink how uh, wages are set at all, who, why we sell our, wage for a labor, uh, our labor for a wage, um, and the ways in which low-wage work is more problematic than just the wage level. And like I said, it's Low-wage work is a stopgap measure that allows this other highly dysfunctional system to persist of people that have high wages and have to work all the time and can't balance their lives. Obviously, it's, we still don't have control over our work. We're alienated. We're exploited. Um, and even with a higher wage, even at $15 an hour, many workers are still going to be in poverty. They're not going to necessarily have career letters. They're not going to necessarily have, you know, kind of rewarding work. So I think that we need to rethink, we need to use the living wage and minimum wage campaigns to rethink and reframe how we think about work. 
it may be also at this moment where we tie in, traditionally as the left, we've often promoted this notion of full employment as a way to solve poverty and as a way to deal with inclusion. But with the environmental crisis that we're living and the notion of full employment that may rest on economic growth, it may be the time to also rethink some of those ideas as well and to rethink what we mean by work and to say that green jobs is also childcare and green jobs is healthcare, it's taking care of one another and taking care of the planet. We don't have to just only think of green jobs as, you know, creating solar panels or, um, you know, making, you know, healthier uh, kinds of technologies. That's fine too, but, um, you know, so there's other ideas, ideas like the basic income grant that would allow us to rethink the amounts of work we do, also demands to just shorten the work week, um, spread the work, redistribute the work. Um, those are the kinds of questions I think that we should be raising. So. I've raised concerns about minimum wage and living wage, but I still fundamentally support it. I think as leftists, we absolutely have to be engaged in these struggles. I think they're a useful tool to build coalitions, to have great dialogue with people we have, you know, we can open the door and say, how does the economy work? You know, what, why does the employer get to set wages like that? Um, I think also by raising wages, we stabilize uh, people's lives and it makes a huge impact on the people that get those wages. It reduces <coughs> turnover and it creates a better condition for organizing. You know, one of the challenges of unionizing a low wage workforce is that the turnover is once a month, there's a whole new workforce there. So raising wages helps stabilize that. It makes more fruitful terrain for more lasting, sustainable organizations. Um, and I think I would just say, um, Another thing is, as, as the left, our movements often fail. So the minimum wage is also one where we win sometimes. It's good to have wins. I think we can learn a lot. We learn a lot from our failures, but we can learn from our wins as well. I think we just have to remember the kinds of wins that we want um, and how to distinguish between you know, wins that help us build. And I think that the criteria I will end with by saying, we want to engage in these campaigns, not just that raise the wage, but gain campaigns, minimum wage campaigns, that incorporate the, those workers that are most affected, that build them as leaders, campaigns that build our capacity to enforce the laws that we win, that enforce, uh, that build our capacity to build future struggles. Um, I think we want to develop our own thinking as political actors, but also get a much better understanding of our opposition, understand why some corporations are raising their wages now, why the IMF is saying that, they, that unions might be the answer. And I think more than anything, we want to just keep promoting a long-term vision and say, where do we want to be in 20 years? Not just, you know, where do we want to be at the end of this union campaign or at the end of this contract or the end of this wage, but where do we want to be in 20 years and how does the minimum wage and living wage campaign fit into that long, longer vision? Um, how can we rethink the part of this that's about the living and not just about the wage? So, um, so I think I'll end there and then we can have some discussion. So thank you so much. Thank you.